for longer than two weeks, and I apologize for that. <laughs> Quick recap, the month of September was absolutely crazy for my job. It was crazy to the point that I kind of just had to go poof for a little bit. Kind of had to, you know, work to get money for food and car stuff and, you know, to live. But it's a Halloween miracle because I am back for more amazing stories to bring you all. And I moved all of my stuff to, oh, my cat's out the door. Elsa. In now. Anyway, I am back. Let's do this thing. Let's get back into things. You are literally on death's door. You see Mr. Skull here? You're about to become him if you don't stop doing what you're doing. Okay, now go away. For our first story on this wonderful time of Halloween, we are going to talk about the women that started one of the greatest religious movements of the 19th century spiritualism. I personally am spiritual and it has helped me in my life growth in leaps and bounds. So me being me, I wanted to know the history behind it. And that's when I found the Fox sisters. Let's get started. My spiders. This is Sam and this is Harold. I hate spiders, but for some reason, Halloween for me, it's okay. This is one of the more complicated stories I've researched because unlike all my other stories where we have focused on just one, we are going to talk about three. So I've made this as simple as I can. The Fox sisters consist of three sisters. <laughs> yeah. Leah, the oldest, born on April 8th, 1813. Margareta, or Maggie, the middle sister, born on October 7th, 1844. And Catherine, or Kate, the youngest, born on March 27th, 1837. Their parents were John and Margaret Fox, and Maggie and Kate lived with their parents in Hydesville, New York, which is just outside of Newark, while the older sister, Leah, lived in Rochester. The parents were Methodist and John owned a farm in 1847. Jumping ahead here, on a late day in March 1848, Maggie, who was 14, and Kate, who was 11 at this time, were eager to talk to a neighbor about strange things going on in their home. The girls said that every night around bedtime for the past month, they would hear noises all around their house. Ooh. <laughs> By this point, the parents were just fed up and sent the girls to bed early so they could catch up on lost sleep and the parents could have just a quiet night. However, as soon as the girls tucked themselves under their covers, the noises started again. But this time, the noises were louder and more frantic than ever. The noises were coming from the floorboards, ceilings, bed frames, even the door frames. Now, this was actually a bit of a pattern. It seemed that wherever the girls went, the noises followed, like they were being pursued in a way. Margaret, the mom, understandably, was convinced that something demonic was in their home and she did the correct thing. Sent her husband to get the neighbor for help. Personally, I would have just left, but hey, you do you. Go get the neighbor to help with these mysterious noises that are coming from your freaking ceilings. That evening, neighbor William Dullersturd stood awestruck in the candlelight as the noises continued. Margaret, for some reason, decided to do a demonstration. She's, huh, why? She spoke to the heir, count five, she said, and five heavy Raps, or thuds, answered. Count 15, Margaret asked again, and 15 raps were answered again. She then, why are we on the third try? She then asked the spirit to tell William's age, and 31 raps came through. They then asked more questions, and more thuds and raps answered. By about the second time when I said, can you count to 15 and 15 knocks came out. I would have just left, but whatever. Then things got real weird. Slowly, a spirit began to take form. People could see features 
but didn't know who it was. And no one asked the spirit's name. I mean, why wouldn't you ask a spirit that just materialized in front of you? Hey, what's the name? However, the older brother, David, thought of going through letters of the alphabet to figure out who the spirit was, but apparently that didn't happen. In later weeks, locals began to remember about a peddler that had died some years earlier. Plus, it turned out that David was suspected to be digging beneath the family house one summer and had dug up bone and human teeth. Later, it turned out that the spirit was a 31-year-old peddler who was apparently murdered for 500 bucks then buried under the fox's home by a previous owner. So that's great. The sisters gave this ghost the name, I kid you not, they named the ghost Mr. Splitfoot, which apparently is a nickname for the devil. That's normal. This ghost, Mr. Splitfoot. Remember Mr. Splitfoot, that's all I'm gonna say. After a few more sessions, I don't know why they kept going, but I guess why not at this point? The family deserted the home. I would too faster than Amityville Horror. Now, either Kate went to live with her older sister Leah in Rochester, who was married at this point and was now Leah Fox Fish. Sometimes the jokes just write themselves and Maggie went to live with their older brother, David, or both sisters went to live with Leah in Rochester. Regardless, the story would have ended there were it not for the fact that weird things kept happening to both sisters. Now, I'm not speculating that it was when weird things kept happening that that's when Maggie went to live with her sisters in Rochester because the brother couldn't handle the weird spirit tappy thingies. Look, if my sisters in the middle of their night when tapping noises are going on and have been going on for a month and then my mother started to ask a ghost questions and then a ghost appeared like a Bob Ross painting and then when we moved out of the house and my sister came to live with me that the ghosts and the spirits and the tappies kept on coming, I would have told her, you go live with your other spirit tapping magnet sister. Now living in Rochester, Leah began to see that her younger sisters had some talent and decided to turn this into a business. She became their manager and soon the sisters' fame as mediums was immense. Before we move on, let's talk about why the sisters got so famous in a pretty short amount of time. Rochester, New York in the 1840s was a hotbed for reform and religious activity, specifically the Finger Lakes region. Quick sidetrack here because this is amazing. It's called the Finger Lakes because according to a Native American legend, the creator looked upon this land with special favor and reached down to bless it, leaving the imprint of his hand, hence the Finger Lakes. I had to know why it was called the Finger Lakes, found that, love it. All right, back to the story. This region gave birth to Mormonism, the precursor to the Seventh-day Adventism, and Millerism, which basically follows the teachings of William Miller. He believed that roughly in 1843, 1844, Jesus Christ would come back to earth, an event he called the Second Advent, and his teachings got popular. But of course, when nothing happened, this event became known as the Great Disappointment. Beautiful. <laughs> Longtime friends of the Fox family and radical Quaker couple, Amy and Isaac Post, invited the three sisters to their home after hearing about Mr. Splitfoot <laughs> and asked the girls to communicate with spirits in another place. I couldn't find exactly where it was. Quote, I suppose I went with as much unbelief as Thomas felt when he was introduced to Jesus after he had ascended, but he was swayed by, quote, very distinct thumps under the floor and several apparent answers, end quote. Isaac was further convinced when Leah proved to be a medium herself when she communicated with the post recently deceased daughter. After this session, the posts helped spread the word of the sisters' amazing abilities among their fellow radical Quaker friends, and on November 14th, 1849, the Fox sisters demonstrated their gifts to nearly 400 people in the Corinthian Hall in Rochester. 
How they got the haul, I don't know. Now, the reason why the Post invited the Fox sisters into their home and then helped them into the biggest haul they could get, it's actually pretty simple. The reason they were considered radical Quakers is because not only were they leaders in anti-slavery and women's rights movements, but they were also some of the first believers in spiritualism. Interestingly, with the Post inviting the sisters into their home, them spreading their abilities to friends and what the Post helped with in movements, it is in this way there appeared to be an association between spiritualism and radical political causes, such as temperance, abolition, and equal rights for women. I don't exactly know where women's rights and spiritualism, talking to ghost things match, but whatever. Now, what? is spiritualism. Well, it's more than Ouija boards, tarot cards, and witch spells. It is the belief that direct communication with God or angels is possible. First scenes in the writings of Swedish philosopher and scientist Emanuel Swedenborg and the teachings of Australian physicist Franz Messimer. Emmanuel claimed to be able to talk to spirits while awake and described the structure of the spirit world. This is fascinating. Stay with me here. Essentially, there are two features. One, there is not a single hell and heaven. Rather, there are a series of higher and lower heavens and hells. And two, spirits are intermediates between God and humans, and the divine uses the spirits to communicate with humans. I mean, does that not make sense? Emmanuel started out as a highly regarded inventor and scientist. Then in 1741, he began to see a series of intense mystical experiences, dreams, and visions that claimed he had been called to by God to reform Christianity and introduce a new church. Quote, the Lord cast no one into hell, but those who are there have deliberately cast themselves into it and kept themselves there. End quote. Franz, on the other hand, did not bring any new religious beliefs, but he did bring a technique, which would later be known as hypnotism. He proposed that everything in the universe, including the human body, was governed by a magnetic fluid that could become imbalanced, which caused illness, and that by waving his hands over a patient's body, he could manipulate the magnetic force and restore health. Personally, that sounds more like Reiki than hypnosis, but that's just what I think. 75 years later, American seer, who is a person that prophesizes future events, Andrew Jackson Davis, who'd become known as, and I kid you not, John the Baptist of modern spiritualism, combined the two ideologies claiming that Emmanuel's spirit himself spoke to him in a series of trances. Andrew recorded these messages in a volume of books in 1847, The Principles of Nature, Her Divine Revelations, and A Voice to Mankind. Andrew predicted the rise to spiritualism, saying, quote, It is a truth that spirits commune with one another while one is in the body and the other in the higher spheres. All the world will hail with delight the ushering in of that era when the interiors of men will be opened and the spiritual communication will be established." End quote. About a year later, on the same day the Fox sisters first channeled spirits, he wrote in his diary, about daylight this morning, a warm breathing passed over my face and I heard a voice, tender and strong, saying, Brother, the work has begun. Behold, a living demonstration is born. Now that's a prediction. Andrew and the sisters would meet after Andrew heard about the sisters' sessions with the posts, the demonstration at Corinthian Hall, and newspaper articles about the sisters. He invited them to his home in New York City to see for himself their medium gifts. And it seemed that for a time, they had joined forces, and it helped elevate Andrew and the sisters' careers and stature. Due to this, Maggie and Kate became famous mediums and held seances for hundreds of people. However, the first couple of seances was a complete joke due to the fact that people wanted insights into the state of railway stocks 
or questions of love affairs. I mean, it's not that far off from what people ask about today. Soon after the fame started to really take off, Maggie, Kate, and Leah went on tour to spread the word of spirits. One demonstration was in a suite at Barnum's Hotel in Baltimore. And yes, the hotel was owned by a cousin of the infamous P.T. Barnum. What a small world is that? That's so cool. They held sessions in the hotel's parlor for $1, which is about $40 in today's money, and would have as many as 30 people in attendance. Some of the attendees included New York High Society, including politician and publisher of the New York Tribune, Horace Greeley, romantic poet and longtime editor of the New York Evening Post, William Cullen Bryant, abolitionist and activist for African-American civil rights, Sojourner Truth, abolitionist, journalist, and social reformer, William Lloyd Garrison, and many more. Now, Horace kind of became a bit of a protector for the sisters, which in turn helped them get into higher social circles. And though he watched over the girls, the parental supervision, if you would, was not the best because Maggie and Kate would start to drink wine and Leah just kind of let it happen. And it is at this point that the girls were not of drinking age, should I say. Remember this part about the drinking. With this early state of spiritualism and overall mediumship, there are, of course, critics and plenty of people denouncing the girls as fakes. The criticism went to the point that in the beginning of 1850, the girls were made to do a medical investigation, I kid you not. Physicians E.P. Longworthy and John W. Hearn, Reverend John M. Austin and Reverend D. Potts concluded that the girls could make rapping noises themselves. Notably, Reverend C. Chauncey Burr wrote in the New York Tribune that the cracking of their toe joints were so loud that they could be heard in a large concert hall. So basically, they cracked their knuckles. In the same year, investigators at the University of New York at Buffalo found that the rapping noises were produced from their joints in their bodies and the raps would stop if cushions were under their feet. Very interesting. In 1851, a family relative of the Fox family, Mrs. Norman Culver, admitted that she assisted the girls in their seances by touching them when to start the rapping noises and had claimed that Kate and Maggie told her of their ability to produce the noise by snapping their toes, knees, and ankles. In 1857, the Boston Courier put out a $500 prize to any medium that could show paranormal abilities to their committee. The Fox sisters tried and were then investigated by a committee that had magician John Wyman on it. The committee concluded that the raps were produced by bone and feet movement that the sisters couldn't challenge. Again, it's a very unique thought. Prominent British physicist and chemist Sir William Crookes examined Kate between 1871 and 1874, and he too concluded that the raps were genuine. But it's said that William was a little bit gullible and other mediums he had investigated used trickery on him. Them dang witches. Harry Houdini himself who had devoted a large part of his life to debunking spiritual abilities, said, quote, As to the delusion of sound, sound waves are reflected just as light waves are reflected by the intervention of a proper medium and under certain conditions, it is a difficult thing to locate their source, end quote. I mean, Houdini said it. Again, I don't know how Houdini fits into this, but that's, I don't know, it just gives you a weird taste in your mouth. Despite these critics and skeptics, the sisters' fame kept growing. Maggie expanded her career as a medium after leaving the home with her sisters and went with a different older sister, Mrs. Underhill, in 1852 in Philadelphia. In that same year, she met and married Arctic explorer Elijah Kent Kane. 
Now, we don't completely like this guy because he was convinced that Maggie and Kate were engaged in fraud under their sister Leah. So he wanted Maggie to break away from the group. Now, I don't know if Maggie did what Elijah wanted, but regardless, he married her and Maggie converted to the Roman Catholic faith, having been told that her abilities were diabolical. How dare you talk to spirits? Just like how every person in the history of the Bible of ever has talked to spirits. How dare you talk to spirits? However, when Elijah died five years later in 1857 in Havana, Cuba, after two strokes, Maggie went back to being a medium. Unfortunately, during this time, she began severely drinking and it got worse after her husband's death. Left with a broken heart and almost penniless, her mental state and health began to take a dive. Kate, on the other hand, traveled to England in 1871, a trip that was paid by a rich New York banker. This trip was so that Kate wouldn't have to take payment for her medium sessions. This was due to the fact that this trip was considered missionary work since she only sat for well-known people. In 1872, Kate met and married legal scholar, London Barrister, which is basically the British version of a trial lawyer and enthusiastic spiritualist, Henry D. Jackson. They had two sons, Ferdinand, born in 1873, and Henry, born in 1875. Reportedly, Ferdinand was a medium by the age of three, saying that spirits took over his body and caused a, though, this is, I don't know what I would do if my kid did this, an unearthly glow coming out from his eyes. It's different. During this time, Kate was able to develop her powers. She would speak to the spirits while writing the translated messages on a blank card at the same time, which is I believed called spirit right? If I'm remembering correctly? Apparently, during a session with Charles Livermore, a wealthy banker, Kate summoned Charles's two dead wives and the ghost of Benjamin Franklin, who identified himself by writing his name on a card. Quick side side note here. I want to know what the conversation was between Charles and, and the wives. And why did Benjamin Franklin just like want to interject himself into the conversation? Kate's business boomed during and after the Civil War, as more and more grieving family members of fallen soldiers and ordinary people found comfort in spiritualism. Famous spiritualist Emma Hardinge said that the war added two million believers to spiritualism, and by the 1880s, an estimated eight million followers in the U.S. and Europe. With this boom in the movement that was being helped by Kate being able to now summon full-on ghosts at every seance, she began to drink to deal with the stress. Unfortunately, Henry died from a stroke in 1881 and left her a single mom of two sons. She went back to New York and in early 1888, Kate was arrested for drunkenness and laziness. Didn't know you could be arrested for laziness? And unfortunately, due to this, welfare took custody of her sons. But she was able to get her boys into the custody of an uncle in England. Leah here had a bit of a better life. After the death of her first husband, which when her sisters came to live with her, her husband had abandoned her, leaving her to live in poverty. So he's awesome. Leah leveled up and married a successful Wall Street banker. Take that, dirtbag. <laughs> okay, so the sisters are doing fine. Two could be doing a little bit better, but things are going relatively okay. Well, this is when we start to not like at least one of them, Maggie. Something happened between the sisters, either a disagreement over Kate's drinking and ability to care for her sons, or a drunken fight that Maggie and Kate were so peeled by that they wanted to harm Lee as much as they could. And how did they do this? Well, 
Maggie and Kate went to New York City where a reporter from the New York World offered them $1,500, which is about $50,000 in today's money, if the sisters would expose their methods and give him an exclusive story. On October 21st, 1888, Maggie along with Kate appeared at the New York Academy of Music where in front of an audience of 2,000 people, she publicly denounced spiritualism and that the sisters' communication with the dead was all a hoax and showed how she could produce the rapping noises at will and the sounds could be heard throughout the theater. Plus, doctors came up onto the stage and verified the cracking noises of her joints was indeed the source of the sounds. Yeah, I, yeah, we don't like Maggie anymore. Reportedly at the public demonstration, the New York Herald said that Maggie, quote, was greeted with cheers and hisses. Yay! Also, according to the Herald, Maggie told the crowd, quote, when I began this deception, I was too young to know right from wrong, that I have been mainly instrumental in perpetrating the fraud of spiritualism upon a too confiding public. Many of you already know, it is the greatest sorrow of my life, end quote. Maggie went on to accuse Leah of forcing them to do public performances as mediums. Quote, I have seen so much miserable deception. That is why I am willing to state that spiritualism is a fraud of the worst deception, end quote. All the while, Kate, sitting in a stage box, nodded her head in agreement. Now we can give Kate a bit of a break because A, she didn't say anything during the interview and later she came out and said that she did not agree with her sister and continued her mediumship career. Now, the whole point of this interview was to enact a sort of revenge on her sister Leah and to just simply rage on the spiritualism community. And it seemed to have worked but very mildly. Mainstream media called the interview a deathly blow and critics laughed and screamed, I told you so. Great pillars of society. <laughs> Spiritualists came out and denounced Maggie's confession saying that she was a, <laughs> this is really mean, that she was a sad and tired drunk. And her sister Leah turned her back on her sisters who she considered an embarrassment. Regardless of Maggie's motives, it seemed that the ridicule had been bad enough that in 1891, Maggie recounted her confession, saying that her spirit guides told her to do so, but the damage was done. From that point forward, it was hard for Maggie and Kate to get work after the interview, and they became complete drunks. Leah Fox died on November 1st, 1890 at the age of 72 and was mourned by many spiritualists around the world and is buried with the rest of the Fox family in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. Leah's death was very peaceful compared to her sisters. Catherine Fox, living in poverty and after a drunken spree, drank herself to death and died in her home at 609 Columbus Avenue in New York City on July 2nd or 3rd, 1890 at the age of 56. And her body was found by one of her sons. Margareta Fox, deep in alcoholism and living on charity as a tenant in an old apartment on 456 West 56th Street, died eight months after Kate on March 8, 1893 at the age of 59 at a friend's home in Brooklyn. At the time of her death, she was penniless. Talk about a fall from fame. Regardless if the Fox sisters were real mediums or not, they were the main starters of a massive movement that lives on to this day. Interestingly and unbelievably creepily, in 1904, school kids playing in the Fox sisters' childhood home in Hydesville, cause why not? The house became locally known as the Spook House. Very creative. 
the kids found the majority of a skeleton between the walls of the crumbling cellar walls. A doctor then examined the bones and thought that the bones were around 50 years old. The Boston Journal did a story on the discovery on November 22nd, 1904, claiming that the bones were of a peddler meaning that the sister's tale of messages from a dead peddler could have been true. But the police did not open an investigation at that time. And five years later, a different physician, Joe Nickel, examined the bones and said that the bones were of an animal, specifically a chicken, and said that they were placed there as a joke. And apparently the dude that put the bones in the walls of the cellar was too ashamed to come forth. I don't know. However, a few years after the first discovery, a peddler tin box was apparently found in the cellar along with the remains. And this box is in the Lilydale Museum. There has been no confirmation that this peddler existed. So Mr. Splitfoot is still unknown. Okay, so there's the story of the Fox sisters. The start of the spiritual movement, whether they were frauds or not, they were the cornerstone of the spiritualist movement. And besides, spiritualism and seances is really nothing new. I mean, Mary Todd Lincoln held seances in the White House to talk to her dead son, and Queen Victoria held seances to talk to her deceased husband, Prince Albert. Whether you believe in seances and spiritualisms and mediums or not, it's nothing new. And for some it works, some it doesn't. It all just depends in my mind on whether you believe it or not. Believing in things you can't see are sometimes the most real things on this earth. If you learned something today, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. And while you're down there, please leave a friendly comment. I will be back next week with another story. And until then, don't be well behaved. You just might make history. See you next time, guys. Come